Hello, my name is Michael Morris and I'm the superintendent of the Amherst Regional School District and welcome into the latest episode of Window into ARPS. For this episode, I'm thrilled to welcome our two guests today. So with me is Angela Oldenbarka, a high school senior, uh, and John Bechtold, who is the chair of the Performing Arts Department across the secondary district. So thank you both for being here. Really appreciate you making time out of your very busy schedules as the semester has changed over to the second semester uh, to be with us to share about your experiences um, in a very powerful uh, play or production, excuse me, that was recently put on at the high school. So thank you both for being here. Thanks thank for having you. us. Yeah, and before we get into the, the details of the Laramie Project, we'd, I'd love to start, start with John. Tell me a little bit about yourself, how you came to Amherst Regional High School and, and how you got involved in theater yourself. Sure, um, those things are, are somewhat related, fortunately. <laughs> and I'm very proud to say that I ended up in Amherst as the result of an Amherst High School alum who was a good friend of mine in college talked me into playing Ultimate Frisbee, and we became fast friends soon after. And then we also realized that we had interest in other things such as theater. So um, when it came time to look for jobs as a college senior, and I had my teaching certification ready to go, I was just casting out into the open, and she saw her high school on a listing at random at, at college. I applied, and all of a sudden, it was the first thing I'd ever applied for, and it's the place I still am. So that's where I ended up, uh, and it's, it's been pretty great ever since. I started as an English teacher and slowly got to transform into more of a theater teacher. That's great. And how many years have you been at the high school at this This point? is year 19. Yeah, that's pretty exciting. Yeah, it's <laughs> awfully exciting. And Angela, I would love to hear a little bit about how you got involved in the performing arts program at the high school. Yeah, I mean, going into the high school, I knew that I was sort of interested in theater, and so I signed up for a couple of acting classes. I think I had acting one and stage craft my freshman year. Uh, and uh, then going from there, it just became very easy to get <laughs> pulled into the department and into all of the various productions that are happening. And I'd like to thank you both for that, and I'd like to transition talking particularly about the production that happened over the past, past few months about the Laramie Project. You know, uh, John, you talked to me about this over a year ago, I think, um, yeah. that you were thinking of, of trying to do this you know, at our high school. You were aware of some of the controversy that has um, kind of brewed in some communities uh, as, as it relates to this play and high school students. And I want to say we're on the, we're on the back end of this, right? The play has happened, and the, the, I still receive uh, accommodations that I don't deserve, frankly, from people in the community who's, who uh, participated and witnessed and uh, attended the production and were blown away and, and how it's still very relevant for them, even though weeks have passed since it happened. So I'd love to hear a little bit about what compelled you or compelled you know, the high school to put on this particular production um, you know, done by high school students for the high school and the larger community? Sure. Um, well, there are several forces at work. Um, the most, I think, on the surface one was that we're in the 20th year of looking back at Matthew Shepard's death and everything that has come with it, what has changed, what has not changed. Some people might have seen that he was reinterred uh, this fall yeah. at the National Cathedral. And with that context in mind, it, it sparked some conversations with me and, and some students last spring about um, imagining what the late 90s were and, and what has changed now in 2018, 2019. Uh, and that in itself became a reason to think about the play because the play, when we read it and looked at it, still felt incredibly relevant, like it could have been written yesterday. And that in itself, I think, made a case for why it needed to be done. We we're also very interested in a play that's been very successful across a lot of schools and communities across the nation. Um, it's been around since the early 2000s, but we hadn't found anyone that had done it in a format um, that we like to do plays at the high school called immersive theater, where the audience suddenly is in a position of agency um, and has more responsibility to unpack the play in a, in a real and more felt way. So we got very interested in about bringing this very powerful story that needed to be re-explored in this very powerful format and putting them together. Angela, from the student perspective, uh, what did you hear as student response when there was, you know, it was announced that the Laramie Project was going to be the play that produced at the high school? Mm -hmm. uh, how did students perceive that, and and you know, did it feel relevant in, in your experience to mm -hmm. to the current experience of high school students in 2019? Mm -hmm. I found out that it was uh, going to be one of the plays at the end of year student cleanup theater department event cleanup organization <laughs> thing um, and uh, 
that definitely just right there, f hearing what that was and hearing just a little bit about it, I definitely saw with myself and other theater people uh, an excitement that we were going to be exploring that. Um, I think that it's also very relevant that we had the um, saga, the Sexuality and Gender Alliance students come into that and um, so we had that connection with the people outside of the theater department who hadn't done that much theater before, who hadn't been involved in the theater department, that they came into that and we had that, I think, and I think that that um, connects to how much people did feel the relevance of it and the story. I think Angela's right. There was a really <laughs> wonderful partnership that developed between the theater mm -hmm. company and Saga as we, for the first time in our lives, had student co-producers effectively, yeah. people that were working us on the material, giving us outside perspective, getting involved themselves. And it became a model that I think we all hoped for that the process of making this play was as important as the product for the audiences. And that was yeah. a really good example of that yeah. partnership. And how, so for people who aren't uh, immersed, bad <laughs> choice, but haven't been involved in, in uh, theatrical productions before, um, you described what immersive format might be, but how would you adapt a play? Because my understanding is the play was originally not, it was a more traditional format for the play. What, did it, what does that look like adapting a play that's written uh, more traditionally uh, for an immersive experience? What did that involve from the student end, from your end? And sure. Well, I'll speak a little bit from my mm -hmm. end because um, as a director, you get one experience, and as an actor, mm -hmm. you get another, I think, <laughs> in this situation. But uh, you're right. Laramie Project was originally staged much like uh, a lot of viewers probably know the play Our Town, like kind of that classic of minimal staging. Characters are more or less kind of plain dressed, and they kind of speak through the lives of their characters. And a lot is left for us as the audience to imagine the details, and it's a very powerful format. And the Laramie Project was staged in that fashion, but one thing that we realized early on uh, and wanting to do it was that it was done as a piece of documentary theater. So all the text in the play are verbatim quotes from the 200 plus interviews that a theater company that created this play um, went out and found. So we were working with real people's words. We were working with people that had developed a play through an interview based format and we realized that format was very I and you. When we knew that we had that language that's where the immersive theater question came in because a quick definition of immersive theater is the audience is not outside the world of the play, but is right in the world of the play with the performers. That might mean they have a lot of agency or not very much, but at the very least, they're not in a seat just experiencing things. They're responsible for some of this work. So to put it all together, we created a format where the characters that are always speaking you know, in I and U format directly to audience members as if they were the interviewers themselves. By that, we could create a real human dynamic in the room, and suddenly these pieces could be felt in a much more direct way. So that was the, the intent, but mm -hmm. I think in performance and process, yeah. there's probably lots there to be said. I think that some of the most interesting moments as an actor come from that interaction between the audience and the actors. Um, a lot, uh, for the first two acts, sort of, they were, it was sort of separated into three acts, and for the first two, it was these immersive scenes, and it was loops of the same scene done with different audience members coming in and then leaving, and then new audience members coming in. Uh, and that was done in very close quarters, and it could be as close as we are now. Um, and I think that by seeing the actual visible reactions of the audience. You got a lot out of that as an actor and a lot out of the script. Um, and like I'd have people coming into my room and some people would be laughing at the funny bits or they might end up crying at the scene. You would have all these different people coming in and having real experiences with you. And that's just a very, cool experience that you don't always get to have when you're on stage and the audience is sitting in the dark. Um, and uh, so I think that that is definitely significant for the immersive yeah. actor experience. I think that's well put because the play is about community building mm -hmm. and what it is to be part of a community and to, in a theatrical way, engage the audience so it wasn't you know any kind of like wall between us, but we had to engage the work of connecting with one another 
creates that spirit in, in real time. And that was really kind of exciting. And it's true, audiences were, of, were permitted a wide range of choice and room to have the responses they did. And it was, that also, also meant that the script stage plays are very controllable things. Um, and we were putting ourselves intentionally into a less mm -hmm. controllable format and had to be ready for that. Yeah, I was, mm -hmm. that, that's a great segue to the next question I was thinking when I was hearing Angela speak. You talked about some of the real positives of the, the experience of actors. I wonder what some of the challenges are in, in that less controlled environment uh, mm -hmm. from the actor perspective. I mean, one of the biggest things is that you can't practice that and you can't practice having mm -hmm. this audience that you're playing off of. So you're during rehearsal, you know, you're rehearsing with your fellow actors and you're rehearsing the lines, but you're, especially because a lot of the people who were doing this show were people who had never done immersive theater before and didn't really know what they were getting into. Um, you sort of go into it blind and you can definitely see a very intense learning curve as the <laughs> as just as the performance nights go on um, where you get more acclimated to how you're dealing with that interaction but I think that it's also kind of wonderful that it has that mystery of I don't know what's about to happen <laughs> we're just gonna go in and make this thing this gift that we have and hope that it works and fortunately it did from the reaction of the yeah. community, uh, the, both the ARHS community, but also the larger community as well. Um, so what were some of the surprising, we talked about some of the challenges that you experienced, but what were some of the surprising challenges, challenges that weren't necessarily predictable on the front end as you're thinking about this? There's always that gap between you plan something and then the reality. Uh, <laughs> I think to everything I'm hearing and know about immersive theater, you're sort of increasing that potential gap between what you're planning <laughs> and the reality. What are some things that were unexpected or things that uh, were surprises that you, uh, whether it's from the actor end or the, um, the staff end, you know, had to manage? Sure. Well, I think we could start on the design because this might also help um, build a picture for the play. This is obviously a play not on a stage, as we said, but we haven't defined the territory beyond that. One of the first choices we had to make is if we're going to break this play up and fragment it across spaces so that audiences could freely wander into those spaces at their choosing, we had to define those terms. So we ended up using, I'd say, about a quarter of the school building. Um, certainly uh, a big main section of it that involved the cafeteria area, the library, side hallway, the entire performing arts wing. So we had to start with space and decide how this world actually lived in those spaces and where these characters resided. And we had to do it in a way that took into account that we didn't get to perform on a stage. We were in people's classrooms and in the hallways and schools the next day. And how do you think about set design and lighting in that situation. So we had to solve a lot of problems uh, with figuring out how to live in someone else's spaces that were being wonderful hosts to us um, and still make it all go poof pretty much every <laughs> night and then reinstall it the following one. So that was fun and challenging, including some of the things we had to figure out a visual motif. And we settled on building set design pieces that were all mobile structures so that they didn't have to sit on the things. We could just suspend them. And they were all built out of old fence wood, um, which became this solution for how could you build something into the space. But that took us a good while to solve. Um, and then the installation itself, of course, was, <laughs> uh, there were many uh, late night uh, challenges and, and pretty, pretty silly moments that come out of like, how do I actually hang this thing 20 feet in the air? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, with so school that has to operate during yeah. the day while the show is happening. It's not like the school shut down for a week while the production was occurring. So yeah. I know that was another tension point or mm -hmm. challenge to figure Absolutely. out, right? You couldn't be like, oh, no, no one can eat lunch for while the play right. is going on. So, <laughs> you know, or the library, you mm -hmm. know, and they, I'm sure they were wonderfully accommodating. But, you know, students were still looking for research and doing their work. A hundred percent. And, of course, we want that a bit. We wanted to be, had to have a visual imprint on the school day. But balancing that against the needs of the school, the needs of the show, was always a trick. But we like that because I think the, the added bonus to that, as opposed to a stage play, is that we create a lot more room, quite literally, for students to have to design and figure mm -hmm. out how they're staging or doing something. By definition, I can't be the sole director of it. Angelo and everyone else has to end up taking a big part of the direction mm -hmm. of their own work. Otherwise, it doesn't get done. Right. 
Any other surprising challenges that you experienced? The main one that comes to mind is I just remember a techie friend of mine coming in every day and <laughs> talking about, oh yeah, the big installation thing that we were going to have <laughs> in the middle of the, the <laughs> school was way too heavy, so we couldn't use it, so now we're trying to figure out what we're going to do instead. Yeah. Going to take something from the library, put that up there. Yeah, I'd, I'd say the set stuff was huge. And then like Angela was saying, just you cannot you can plan all you want for an audience response and you will they will always outguess you or produce a mm -hmm. new behavior and so learning how to manage that and like you're also saying having students that were relatively new to this idea mm -hmm. of giving the audience that much freedom we had we learned i think one concrete thing on the dress rehearsal night which is the only night we get before we open with a, an outside audience we realized we needed kleenex stations that was a very <laughs> real concern yeah. that we needed like a space and a capacity for people to step out when they needed it if something got particularly powerful. Um, we also needed to know how to manage the lighter stuff too, but that, that stayed poignant, going out and buying a dozen boxes of tissue and strategically placing them around the school. Right, that's fascinating. And so you, you, you talked a bit about the, you know, the stage pieces of it, so given that it's an immersive theater, you've sort of described it, but who was doing that stage tech work and how is that work actually happening in real time, given that it was not happening in the auditorium or exclusively in the auditorium, but it was happening in different areas around the school? That's a great question, too. It, uh, the work starts on spreadsheets. We have, fortunately, incredibly mm -hmm. skilled students that lead the charge, and we are in charge of mapping the show. So setting up what happens where at what time, structuring rehearsals with me. There's over 60 scenes in the show that need to be rehearsed and prepared, and with many overlapping characters. So students had to be responsible for the matrix of how all that plays out. So I would say there's there's certainly an upper echelon of student leadership from our kind of our titled roles, from our student tech director to our stage managers, um, to having students like Angela that are just you know kind of old hats at this that we can that I can rely on to take care of something. We have a very divide and conquer sort of approach. <laughs> um, so we each find parcels of the show. I work with a few student designers to keep the overall picture, but then. We're out and running and checking in frequently, and it is a little chaotic. Um, yeah. Not in a bad way, I'd say, in a way that really helps us find the good stuff. But there's a lot of trust that comes with that. Yeah. Um, it's worked out pretty well. Mm -hmm. So, Angela, what was the, you described this experience for you. What would you how would you describe the show experience for the full cast? Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, a, a bunch, uh, student actors who are involved in this immersive experience. Um, one thing I particularly want to put a finer point on is there's, to, Mr. to John's point, there's, there's so much uh, intense emotion that would come given the content. Mm -hmm. And how did it feel to be an actor, you know, both had experienced that yourself and still come through as an actor and also respond to the audience mm -hmm. who is so, so proximate in terms yeah. of their reactions? I think one of the more interesting conversations I had after the show was uh, with my mom. And she had gone to see it twice. And uh, she was asking me, how, how were you able to for a full month be going through this intensely emotional stuff and be working through all that because she had had to step out for one of the scenes she couldn't see it again because it was just very emotional um, and uh, I was thinking and uh, I wasn't really sure but then I came to the conclusion that what it really was is the community that we had formed and also the fact that the show is formatted in a more theatrical sense. It isn't meant to be a sort of photorealistic yeah. representation. And so actors have the opportunity to step out of their characters. And it's not just a night of being this one character and saying all of these words and living and reliving all of these intense, intense emotions. Um, you always have the opportunity to between scenes and between switching roles because a lot of people were playing multiple roles take a moment to be yourself and still be in the mindset of the show but to release that all of that internal everything um, and uh, I remember there was one scene that was probably the most emotionally intense for me where um, I would be uh, sort of uh, having a verbal battle with uh, another friend of mine who uh, would be uh, shouting slurs across the room and um, just these really intense things. And uh, I think that it's significant that while the audience 
after that scene sort of was ushered up onto the stage and had to wait and be prepared for the next thing, I was able to always go back around them and have a moment to just hug that friend and just stand there and accept that this isn't who we are, we're playing roles, just let it all go and then go back and have that experience again and keep doing that. Uh, you were asking about surprises, or maybe that was one of the biggest ones. I, I know that I did not fully anticipate the emotional weight of carrying that work for over a month. Mm -hmm. um, and I wasn't acting in it. I, I had the easiest part, I think, for Angela and for students that had to play uh, roles, some of which are incredibly yeah. you know, bigoted, hateful language, to see some of the sweetest people that you've worked with over the years mm -hmm. spouting these yeah, things and needing yeah. to like really deliver. Um, you could see the emotional resources it took and the community it took to support that. And that, that was something mm -hmm. um, you guys did organically and incredibly well. Um, I, I don't think I provided much of a structure for that, having mm -hmm. not anticipated it. And you guys really stepped in. Mm -hmm. What was, um, what do you feel like from the student end that the response was? Um, not for so much for the actors and stage crew, but for mm -hmm. the larger um, student community at the high school. I think it was uh, some of the, I, I feel like uh, I don't generally see that much of a response to theatrical productions, but I remember I uh, I walked into Ceramics one day after the show, the week after the show, and this kid who I uh, hadn't spoken to a lot, just like, that was fantastic, <laughs> and that was his response, and it was, and I got that a lot, and it, there were a lot of students who, um, might not otherwise have been so invested in it, were really moved and it made that vocal to the actors. It was great. One of the, the advantages of a show like this with all the characters that were, had to be portrayed is that we could throw uh, a lot of cast members at it. Again, traditionally the show is done with roughly 10 actors playing a bunch of roles. We threw nearly 50 actors at it, so you had this very large group of people making the work together and then the expanse of their individual friend circles, many of whom came and saw the show. So the end result was a lot of students in the building that we don't always see at other shows having those kinds of responses. Mm -hmm. I agree, that was really rewarding. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are there any other lessons that you, you know, looking back now, it's been, you know, a little bit of time since the show happened. Uh, are there other, you know, kind of the more distance, sometimes after an experience, especially an emotional and intense one that you described, uh, a little bit of distance offers a little bit of time for reflection. Are there kind of thoughts that come to your mind of, you know, what either you or collectively we learned in that process um, and, and maybe a path forward, you know, certainly for John, your senior, so I want to be <laughs> conscious of that. Maybe I'm interested in your story as well, but mm -hmm. just, you know, for the school, what, what did we learn and what was the impact? Because both of you have spoken about that in different ways um, because we, we have a vibrant vi theater department and one of the elements that makes it vibrant isn't just the shows that go on every year, it's actually the school-wide impact that those shows mm -hmm. have. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you had any kind of reflections as the further we get away and um, perhaps less acute um, reflections because we're, we have that distance that you know, I'd be interested in hearing. Sure. Um, well, I, w I would say on the content, and I think there was a sense that when we first started with the work that we were looking at this piece that was 20 years old and that there'd be almost a a predictably safe emotional distance provided for us from it, and we found that that just wasn't true. <laughs> yeah, <not at> <laughs> um, it was like very intensely quick. So I think one of the learnings was that you're uh, never fully over or past the material. That especially if you're trying to take it on a genuine way, you've you've got to be prepared to step back in and not assume that it is a, a kind of like since we are choosing to do this show, therefore we already have a mastery of it. And I think that was really relevant to all theater that. Um, you surrender some control to make some of the best work, and but it is emotionally challenging. Mm -hmm. It's logistically challenging. Um, and then on the, I think just on the grander end, it's really exciting for us to make different kinds of theatrical work than stage plays because we find that we draw different students not just as audiences, but as the potential performers or technicians. So one of our steady is to keep trying to make as much different theater as possible to increase what a student's sense of theater is to, in the first place, but also to draw more corners of the school as best we can. And so that felt very successful on this end, and we, we hope to do more of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that just having the content that people 
very much relate to and very much feel, I think that it showed how much people care about that and how much it helps people to see and to act in that. And I thought that that was just really interesting and wonderful. And it would be great to do more of that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. So as we're, we're closing up with just a couple minutes left, I'd love to hear from Angela, you know, as you're, you know, getting towards the end of mm -hmm. your time at, uh, mm -hmm. in the district, um, you know, what would you tell young students who are entering the high school, younger than you students mm -hmm. anyway, who are entering the high school about the impact of the theater department on, on your experience, mm -hmm. not just necessarily the Laramie Project, but more yeah. generally? I would probably just say do it <laughs> because it's uh, one of the most wonderful communities that I've been able to encounter in the high school. It's just such a home and uh, it's also very possible to be involved in a huge array of different ways and different time commitments and you can be part of the Laramie Project, you can be part of a, an immersive show in the fall or you can do all of the shows or you can do some of the one minute shows in the <laughs> spring and there are just so many different ways to get involved and they are so emotionally impactful and uh, you meet people who you would never otherwise meet and who really influence your life and make it a better place and I think that theater is just a very magical way of exploring different emotions and different realities and things that you don't know about yourself that you then find out about yourself and I think that Beck's a wonderful guy to have in <laughs> charge. <laughs> I would agree. So uh, we do have to wrap up, but I thank mm -hmm. both of you. Angela, I thank you for all mm -hmm. your contributions to the theater program and beyond <laughs> at the high school. And, you know, you're not ready to go yet, but we, <laughs> in not so long, we'll be at the Mullen Center and uh, very excited to see what next steps you take uh, as you. you depart from, from our school district mm -hmm. after um, all, all your time here, not just at the high school, but prior. And John, thank you for your incredible work. Um, you know, I think the, the quick story I'll tell about John, he'll embarrass him, but mm -hmm. he was presenting at a school committee meeting a couple weeks ago and uh, it got delayed and, you know, there was, um, he wasn't sure when he was going to present. He said, oh, I'm just going to, I'm still working. I'll just go down the hall to my, to my space, to the theater, and then just, you know, text when you need me. I'm here. And this is at, you know, 8.30 at <laughs> night. Um, and, and also that he came back to hear students present on a different topic, that he was interested not just in the theater, but there were students presented about restorative justice. And mm -hmm. um, John made the time to, to be part of that lengthy presentation because it was powerful to him. And so I really appreciate all of your contributions at the high school. Thank you so much. And thank you to the viewers for finding out a bit more about the high school theater department and for learning more about our district. And we'll be back next time with an additional episode of Window to Arps. Thank you. <laughs>